working through a short series of videos about how magmas change, and we're now on Roman numeral three. Last time we did magma mixing, and today we're going to get into the FC of AFC processes, assimilation and fractional crystallization. But the FC is fractional crystallization. This is a process that has long been recognized. In fact, Charles Darwin of evolutionary fame in 1844 said that crystals of feldspar enveloped in a mass of liquefied, right, we can picture this comment looking at this part of the image, would rise or sink according to their specific gravity. Hence, crystals of feldspar enveloped in a mass of liquefied but highly vesicular magma would tend to rise to the upper parts, right, because they're buoyant. When crystals or granules of other minerals that are more dense would sink to the bottom. This process, recognized almost 200 years ago, is fractional crystallization. And because a crystal with one composition separates out from the other remaining melt, the composition of the melt will change. So let's say something like this. Composition of melt, of residual melt. Composition of residual melt changes. And it changes because elements are being pulled out by the crystals, which then sink to the bottom or float to the top, etc. The best way that fractional crystallization is explained, or maybe the most classic way, is through something called Bowen's reaction series. And what we're going to do for the remainder of this lecture is just unpack Bowen's reaction series. Reaction series. And it's a schematic, it's a diagram that allows us to understand um, the systematic crystallization of igneous rocks. There are two sides of it, and we're going to start with that. We're going to start up here, and then we're going to work our way down. And this is how it's drawn in every textbook, and we're just going to do it in our notes. Do it with good penmanship as best you can. Oh boy, we got to spell the words right. Discon there's a discontinuous side and a continuous side. Discon continuous side, and then there's going to be a continuous side. And what continuous means is solid solution is operating and is very important. And this side has just different mineral species. So we'll say mineral species, or just actual different minerals are crystallizing progressively. Bones reaction series starts off with these what we could almost do is we put these, let's put the really lightly dashed arrows that are pouring down or like falling down topography, kind of a thermodynamic topography towards a residuum. And down here, this is what I want you to visualize as like the minerals that would form in a pegmatite. They're the things, the last gasps of magma that are crystallizing, and they have more unusual composition. Compositions have been modified by the subtraction of the minerals on these two panels. Now the continuous side is all about plagioclase. And it starts off with the most calcic, which is anorthite. That would be the first thing that crystallizes from a basaltic melt, and we would get a solid solution downwards from anorthite to a different mineral called bytonite, and then labradorite, and andesine, and oligoclase, and eventually to albite. All right, this is a... Oh, man, I spelled that one wrong, too. Forgive me. Let's do it. So albite would be one of these residual things that form that forms in the most felsic magma. So if we're thinking about the magma, we're, we're, we have a mafic magma at the top of this diagram, and things become progressively more felsic at the bottom. We can think about this in temperature as well, yeah? Where this is very hot, 1100, 1200 degrees, and down here we're at the 800 to 700, so I guess we say cold. These are parts of this diagram. Now, there's actually some huge weaknesses to this diagram. However, because it's such a memorable graphic, it is easy for students to memorize and then frame their understanding of fractional crystallization off of. There's a lot of problems with it too, and that is, like, it doesn't actually work. And it, it hides all this nuance. It makes things so simple, but it hides all the nuance. What other minerals would we have um, at the mafic hot? Well, you guessed it, olivine. And then there should be orthopyrexine, which will symbolize as OPX. Then if you progressively crystallize, maybe you're making 
clinopyrexine. Then there is the amphiboles, which would be crystallizing at more felsic, maybe more like, uh, what would we put here? This would be like andesites and dacites by this uh, composition. And then you get biotite here. And so what, what we're going to do is we need to have all the chemical formulas because as olivine crystallizes, Mg2SiO4 gets pulled out of the melt, enriching the melt in everything specifically that's not magnesium. And so what will happen is something with a little bit less magnesium, MgSiO3, will crystallize next. Clinopyrexine, notice no calcium is crystallized yet, yeah? So calcium is getting enriched in the melt until the point where it saturates a phase, clinopyrexine, so we can get CaMgSiO6. You can imagine what comes next. Well, things with potassium and uh, sodium and things like that. Maybe more calcium because we haven't pulled out that much yet. Although anorthite is absolutely pulling out some calcite, right? Because cal that's calcium aluminum 2SI2O8. Another way to um, show anorthite would be saying something is AN100 albite 0. And albite is albite 0 anorthite 100. So the fame, so andesine, we can put andesine in. It's like, you don't need to know andesine, but this would be AN40 AB60, right? We're describing the chemical composition between the solid solution of the albitic end member, which we need to put the chemical formula in, NaAlSi3 O8, and anorthite end member. And this is all happening along a continuous solid solution. Whereas this side is pictured at least as punctuated changes in minerals. We're going to get to why we hate that. Um, but we haven't finished all the chemical formulas. Oh boy, the chemical formula, amphibole and biotite, those are super annoying. Uh, let's not do it perfectly, but let's just get it in the notes. This is uh, KMGFE. 3AL, SI3, O10, OH. That might be wrong, but it's close. Basically, oh boy, that was all biotite. That was all biotite, people. And amphibole is actually, oh, it's even so much longer, right? Calcium, sodium, magnesium, FEAL. And then SI8O22OH. This is an OH2. Anyways, the important, the reason why we're keying in on these chemical formulas is we're pulling this material out of the melt, enriching the melt in the stuff that hasn't yet been pulled out. And so the other things down here at the the merge, um, which of course isn't real, it's just schematic, is things like quartz and case bar. That's microcline and sanidine. KLSI3, 8, SiO2. Uh, muscovite is usually shown down here, although muscovite's really rare unless you're in a pegmatite. Anyways, this is Bowen's reaction series, and it's worth drawing cleanly to understand um, this progressive, systematic, repeated behavior of mafic, min mafic melts crystallizing phases on the top area and more felsic minerals crystallizing from more silicic magmas. But there are major problems with Bowen's reaction series. And so I just wanted to give you a couple opportunities on here to just say the loves. Why do we love Bowen's reaction series? And why do we hate Bowen's reaction series? And we love Bowen's reaction series because it's memorable. It's used in every textbook and has been for a hundred years. And it does show m relative mineral stability in igneous systems and also erosionally in sedimentary systems as well. So we let's just say inverse in seds. Because olivine will break down really fast in a sedimentary rock where quartz and case bar don't. So that's something that we should love about Bowen's reaction series. What we hate is that like it it schematically shows a petrologic process that doesn't even exist. So in reality, maybe we say something like uh, there is no merging. There is no like amphibole doesn't turn into biotite. Like the picture kind of makes it look like this is like a metamorphosis, a transition, but it's not. So let's say no minerals transforming. 
And if you can get that kind of idea, oh, and then also some in phases are left out. So some phases are left out. Important ones too, right? Like magnetite, that didn't make it in there. And zircon didn't make it in there. And apatite didn't make it in there. And so we got to remember that these are still important minerals, even though they're not in Bowen's reaction series. Okay, I think we've done enough there. Let's talk about some more quantitative ways in which this is used. Well, here's a really cool graph from the textbook. And what this graph shows is a TAS diagram. Yes, we look at the X and we look at the Y axes and we see that this is the classic TAS diagram. And this field here shown in gray is basically those 41,000 uh, magma compositions. We showed that maybe last lecture. Basically, most magmas crystallize in this compositional space where we have basalts and we have alkalic uh, things like trachytes and over here we have rhyolites and what this is using is Bowen's reaction series and fractional crystallization to explain magma composition. So let's say FC to explain magma composition. And the power here is that the different important minerals, like quartz, has a composition of SiO2, right? So it's 100 SiO2, whereas forsterite is about 40 SiO2, the rest of it's magnesium. So if forsterite crystallizes right here, it's going to be driving the melt composition in this direction. And if quartz crystallizes here, it's going to be driving the melt composition away from that end member. And so what we have here is a buffering reaction. Anytime we crystallize a new phase, like albite, here we crystallize albite, the residual melt composition after this fractionally crystallites, crest crystallizes, goes down maybe in this direction because the compositions of sodium and potassium are soaked up in the albite. This is how we can change a magma. I think this is a neat diagram. We can also display it in another way, which is those Harker variation diagrams I showed to you earlier. We can plot mineral composition across a suite, and this happens to be an example, example from Crater Lake, where they've taken basalts, here's basalts down here, uh, up to rhyolites, and plotted their compositions, and they plot along trends, which implies that they're related to one another. Let's just do a quick review on a Harker variation diagram. Harker variation diagram, we'll do SiO2, and we'll go MgO. Our starting composition, oh, it's high, and it's low, and it's low, and it's high. And our starting composition will be a basalt in this case. Okay, so it's high in magnesium and it's low in silica. That's our basalt magma. And if our basalt magma crystallizes olivine, which is Mg2SiO4, it pulls the magnesium out, but not very much silica. The residual melt with, a, with every increment of crystallization of olivine should go in this direction because we need to be putting magnesium down. And because it's relatively silica undersaturated, we have to, we're not pulling out that much silica relative to how much was in the magma because it's it ends up being 40% silica, whereas the basalt, let's say, is 50% silica, the silica has to content has to be going up. So this would be one example of a Harker variation diagram showing the fractional crystallization of olivine. Olivine FC example. Now we can do that with a lot of different minerals at a much grander scale. Let's look at magnesium versus silica. So this panel right here is the panel we were just looking at. And it shows that as the magmas at Crater Lake evolve, the initial magmas are enriched in magnesium and go down. Well, this is showing us that olivine probably is crystallizing at Crater Lake. Notice what's going on at the initial composition of, with aluminum. The initial composition of aluminum is going up. Well, does, it make, does olivine explain that? Mg2SiO4? It sure does. 
there is no aluminum being pulled out of the melt initially, and so the aluminum content goes up, as does the silica content, because there is there is no aluminum in olivine. But at some point in the crystallization trajectory, uh, we can stay with blue, aluminum starts to decrease, but silica starts to go up. What is causing that inflection point right here? Inflection. The inflection point is caused by new mineral. A new mineral, another way to say that scientifically would be a new phase has joined the crystallizing assembly. A new phase has joined the crystallizing assembly. What phase is it? Well, it's one that is soaking up aluminum. So, so we say, what phase is it? Well, we know because aluminum's going down, it must have aluminum. And then you go back to Bowen's reaction series and you look for minerals with aluminum. And the most mafic one on there is CaAl2Si2O8, anorthite. And so as we're trying to understand the eruptive history and the magmatic crystallization history of Crater Lake in Oregon, a cascade subduction zone volcano, we can predict that initially olivine was crystallizing and then anorthite joined the crystallizing assembly. I don't see, there is no inflection point here, so maybe olivine was still crystallizing for a time. Okay, so this is how geologists and petrologists, geochemists specifically, use Harker variation diagrams to understand the fractional crystallization of a melt. And here we go, before we end, might as well show you, oh, remember in our notes we were supposed to have textural evidence and compositional evidence as A's and B's, so this is getting a little sloppy, but this is our compositional evidence. leaving us with needing to finish off by giving the textural evidence. What do we actually see in the rock record? Textural evidence. And what we see as textural evidence of fractional crystallization is called cumulates. Cumulates represent the accumulation of crystals, either floating to the top of a magma chamber or sinking to the bottom. They're most prominent in gabbros and in basalts where the low viscosity allows the crystals to separate by density. So cumulates, we're going to say common in mafic melts. And what we see in a cumulate, at least in this outcrop, is notice there's a rhythmic this is like a rhythmic gradient you'd see in sedimentary rocks. And what it represents is layer upon layer of crystals settling out from the magma chamber to the magma chamber floor. And it produces a characteristic texture. If we were to zoom in on this in hand sample or even in thin section, we would see a texture of like olivine phenocrysts that have settled to the floor. So here's like the magma chamber floor. And they've all just sunk down. So we could like have them, them actually like falling down. And they're settling into a pile, basically like snowflakes. And then interstitial to all that, a secondary phase like plagioclase will grow. And then what, what this is, is this would be the cumulate phase. It's the one that accumulates. And then the phase that grows in between it is called the intercumulus phase intercumulus phase. This is a texture to look out for specifically in gabbros crystallizing from mafic basaltic melts. It's classic evidence of fractional crystallization. All right, see you next time where we get into assimilation.